let's talk about some of the other properties. One is that LNG is more dangerous. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's about uh, familiarity. That's kind of why we're out here. And uh, people are very familiar with LPG propane gas. This is one of my favorite ads. This is Blue Rhino in the US. And it shows a pretty lady picking up a canister she's going to throw in the back of the Volvo next to the baby seat with a baby in it and thinks nothing about that energy, yet they fear LNG because they're not used to that source of energy. It's the same natural gas, but it smokes and it's cold. And when you spill it on the carpet, it makes funny sounds. So it's about familiarity. We, we are out here doing this globally to get people more comfortable with the source of fuel. Now, again, the, uh, when we build AP LNG, I don't think we'll use their catchphrase from Blue Rhino, which is spark something fun. <laughs> But we are hoping to get people as comfortable, and it's, it really is about getting people familiar with another source of hydrocarbon. So another myth is that in the event of a release that ignitable gas clouds can travel great distances, stay low on the deck, and find innocent people to um, injure. And what this NFPA 59A does is it has, uh, it's the reg book that where the government has spilled large quantities of LNG. They, measure how long it takes for the vapors to lighten. And then all of these facilities come with an exclusion zone, and that's how long it takes for them to lighten so that uh, gas dispersion and thermal radiation keeps um, dangerous conditions away from public and property. So what I'm gonna do is show you how quickly it does lighten. I'm gonna simulate a spill, and I'm gonna capture the vapors in this balloon, and you'll see that uh, it very quickly um, becomes much lighter than air. So. If you think about the hydrocarbons you use every day, even propane is heavier than air, but the common ones like gasoline and diesel are always heavier than air. They have to be cleaned up. And when you have an issue with them, the gases never lighten and sort of uh, float away on their own. So what you're going to see here is that very quickly it becomes lighter than air and will actually carry the weight of the balloon it behaves a lot more like helium than the other hydrocarbons you're used to using every day. If you can see in there, you'd see the cooler vapors coming in, going to the bottom of the balloon, and then quickly rising to the top of the balloon as they're replaced. And you'll see that right off of a liquid spill that it's already carrying the weight of the balloon significantly lighter than air. Another common misconception is that LNG is explosive. And you hear it com compared to Hiroshima class devices, which is a very fantastic way to describe a conversion, very crude conversion of BTUs to megatons, kilotons. That's not how energy behaves. It doesn't have the potential for instantaneous release. In fact, it's not even flammable in its liquid state because it's too rich to burn. And the reality of it is it's the simplest um, hydrocarbon process. All we do is we take the natural gas that comes in on the pipeline and we cool it down or condense it. I'm actually going to make a little LNG out of the natural gas in this balloon. You'll see it start to condense. We don't store LNG under pressure. It's at atmospheric pressure. We just simply condense it and keep it cool, which is all I'm doing now. now I can do it a lot more efficiently with insulation and things sophisticated process equipment, but you will still see at the bottom of this balloon, you'll see a little bit of liquid, it just made a little LNG, and then it'll quickly vaporize back out and become lighter than air. So that's all we do in the plants, is we just simply cool it down, put it into storage, send it to the customers, they warm it out, send it to homes and businesses. I used to just pop these, but I uh, was doing a presentation at a retirement home in California and decided against it in the future, so. <laughs> I meant for you to catch that. Another common misconception is that LNG carriers are fragile in design. Now, there's been a lot of, with any kind of vessel, there are issues that happen in a marine environment. There's been about 20 various incidents that have happened, yet there's never been the release of LNG. And there's a reason for that. First of all, well, there's a couple things that I want to talk about. One is that people worry about terrorism today. There's never been an attack on an LNG carrier 
but there was an attack on a propane butane carrier in the first Gulf War, which is a prismatic design. Many LNG tankers are prismatic tankers. And it was hit with three Maverick missiles. They're about 16 uh, inches in diameter and about 12 foot long, and they hit where you point them at. Um, so people worry about shoulder-fired weapons and satchel charges and things like that. The reality of it is they penetrated the butane cargo hold, started a pretty significant jet fire, the crew dropped anchor, uh, abandoned ship after shutting down the boilers. And the next day, emergency crews came and extinguished the fires, and about 95% of the original cargo made it to market. As far as I know, the gas fountain is still in. It, I'm sorry, yeah, the gas fountain is still in service. Um, so when these things have happened in the past, the reality of it is these are significant vessels. They are very robust in construction, and there's never been a release. In fact, this is the Paul Kaiser that ran aground from 20 knots to a full stop in one ship's length in 1979. So if you want to talk about energy, that's a significant amount of energy. And you can see the bottom of the hull. It was an accordion. Here's an Exxon Valdez size gap breach in the hull. But there was no release of LNG. And that's for several reasons. One of them is, I'm going to come back to that, that first it's half the weight of crude oil. So we have to carry extra ballast just to keep the vessel stable, which is a greater distance between the outer hull and the inner hull. And we have to keep it cold, so we insulate the tanks. It's more like a cargo vessel. They're individual little tanks of LNG. So if you think about the distance it would take to compromise that, it's significant. You think about the Exxon Valdez or the USS Cole, what they carry to value is right up against the outer tank. So what the oil industry learned from LNG vessels is now we're using OPA-90 tankers and those are doubled hull tankers because that technology has proven over 40 years. Again, not a single spill or release from an LNG tanker. And it, with icing, if you want to talk about how hull, the hulls are really tough, this is uh, the port of Ala in Alaska where our plant is. In the winter of 2006, the icing was so severe that they closed the port to every vessel but our two LNG tankers we were allowed to come in and deliver as normal. So um, pretty robust vessels. And then the history of storage tanks. The reality of it is that uh, these are my 40-year-old storage tanks. They've been through a lot of earthquakes in, in Alaska. In 1996 in Japan, uh, 1995, 6,000 people died in Kobe, Japan. Very severe earthquake. And there were three LNG facilities operating there. What's ironic about that and Hurricane Rita that in both cases, the LNG facilities were ready to deliver gas but had to wait for sub underground um, pipelines to be repaired so they could send out their gas. So very significant facilities. And you know, um, I need water. Here you go. I'm not.